So next up we've got Dr. Sandra Matheson. She's from um, Bellingham. Bellingham here in uh, Washington State and is a uh, beef rancher. Do you prefer rancher? Yeah. That's fine. Is a beef rancher here in the state. And I'll let her talk a little bit more about uh, what she does at her place. Okay, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, there we go. I've been a beef um, cow, we've had a beef cow calf operation for about 65 years in our family. And um, we also, at that time, in the early days, my parents had a grocery store. So I grew up in both the grocery business and having the farm. And we actually used our cattle, beef cattle, in the butcher shop on the, the, in the grocery business. I'm also a veterinarian, now retired, and I took over the farm when my father became ill and about the time that I was still um, in, in vet school and getting out of vet school. Um, there's a picture of my dad and his, with his favorite old tractor and his favorite hat there. Um, but I developed the business into a grass-fed beef business in the last few years, which has been very successful. and. Um, I think much more sustainable in many ways. I'm also a, a holistic, manage educa holistic management educator and a consultant as well. So I just want to talk about what is the reality of climate change when we're as from a, a producer's perspective. Um, we have seen in this area and, and, and even more so in many other parts of the country and parts of the world changing temperatures and different um, weather patterns. We're seeing tremendous drought, fires, and severe weather, um, and those 100-year floods are now becoming like every five years, and then the fires are every year and getting worse. So what does that mean for a, like a, a beef producer such as myself? Um, when we have dry summers, when we've got these droughts, we don't have enough feed, we may not have enough water depending upon our situation. Um, which means that, how does that affect us? That means that we may be forced to sell the cattle um, and sell them at a loss because everyone else in the area is having to do the same thing. And so we have temporarily a drop in the cattle prices. And then eventually, as time goes on and we've got more drought over you know, two, three years, now we've got a cattle shortage going on. So what does that do? It sends the price of the cattle upwards, which is okay if you're um, selling cattle, but not so good if you're buying cattle, trying to replace your herds again. And the price of the cattle also, of course, dictates the price of food, which affects all of us. The other thing that we're beginning to see are um, more health problems related to these changing weather patterns. Um, we're seeing um, here in the Northwest, in Western Washington, we're seeing some, some warmer um, or more mild winters. We're seeing hotter summers. Um, the evening temperatures in the summertime seem to be staying up and um, the days are getting warmer. So as a result, we're seeing more dust in the summertime. We're seeing more mud in the wintertime because we're not getting the freezes. In fact, I, we, I think I only saw a few snowflakes this past winter, which is first in my lifetime, not to have several snows over the course of the winter. So we're seeing um, potential health problems, um, more respiratory disease, um, even in animals that are out on the range, um, which you know should not be stressed, and you know, they're, 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 that are under good management. We're seeing more serious respiratory disease. Um, um, last year in the county, my county, Whatcom County, we saw um, a really um, terrible strain of pink eye come through. I hadn't seen pink eye for probably 25 years, but it came through and it was hitting, you know, quite a number of herds, and it was it was serious very, very serious situation. So we're seeing more potential health problems. And of course, all of this um, manifests as basically a loss of profit. And when you're, you can't make a living at being a rancher or farmer, um, you know, then you've got a tough situation. You've got a loss of, of farmland, loss of ranchers, loss of farms. So how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, and one way is, is creating resilience. We've already heard that already today. Um, many, many times today. And so one of the things that I do in my operation is I use holistic management practices and plan grazing as a way to kind of um, help me be prepared for those times when maybe there, there isn't going to be as much rain in the summertime. 
um, if we are dealing with drought, um, or if there's not enough feed, th those sort of things, and I'll explain a little bit more. So just very briefly, holistic management is a decision-making process that helps us to make better decisions um, in the triple bottom line, meaning environment, the, res the, the finances, and in the, the human aspect as well. It also, um, using those management practices helps uh, me and it has made a tremendous difference on our farm over the years, creating healthier soils, pastures um, with more biodiversity, um, healthier, happier animals being out on the land instead of in the feedlot. So it's something that's just um, really made a, a positive difference for us. Um, grass production, um, I thought we used to have, used to think we had pretty good grass till Till, um, I think it was Steve Franzen taught me how to look down uh, in your pasture instead of looking across. And I realized that, you know, even in western Washington, where you know, if you stand still long enough and you grow moss, uh, there was a lot of bare ground in our pastures. And so by changing the way we managed and grazed the animals, the, it's just tremendous difference and, and much harder to find any bare ground at this point. Um, erosion, so again, if you don't have bare ground, you're less likely to have erosion. Um, I'm able to graze my animals longer, longer in the season, extend the growing season. Well, I shouldn't say extend the growing season, but extend the grazing season, and therefore less winter supplemental feed. It also allows me to plan for those um, summers that are going to be drier because we've seen more of them um, recently. And um, one of the things that that I've kind of discovered over the years. I've talked to many people, and some people seem to be surprised by the fact that, you know, there's a drought and, you know, what are we going to do? Um, but it's becoming so much more commonplace now that this process allows us to actually plan our grazing so that we can allow extra forage for um, the potential situation of a drought or a very dry summer. It also allows us to replan in the case of any crisis that might occur, whether that's fire, you know, drought, floods, whatever it could be. And so ultimately, if we can do that and we're successful at that, um, we can create more profit and therefore stay on the farm or the ranch. Uh, I just want, I'm going back to the slide because um, the process that we've used is um, high density, short duration grazing. We use a lot of electric fencing on our place, and it allows us to, to be able to plan and consider all the complexity of the operation and, you know, what's going on in the environment, what's going on, um, you know, in terms of, you know, whether I'm going to be home or I'm going to be away or someone else has to, to manage the animals or is there a wet area that we have to stay out of at certain times of the year. So it's a way for us to be able to manage those animals and um, just seeing tremendous improvement in the pastures and actually in the health of the animals as well. So this is one way that we can create resilience and um, be able to be proactive in our planning for whatever crisis might occur. Um, other ways to create resilience um, is to really take a look at diversifying your, your feed and your pasture sources. Even as a grass-fed beef producer, um, again, they're not fed grain, but they do in, in the wintertime and early spring, they are supplemented with silage and grass hay. But I can also look at the possibility, or maybe there are some, some crop residues that can be grazed. There are some um, you know, some corn stubble that could be grazed, and there may be neighbors. There's plenty of neighbors that aren't doing anything with their land. And so um, I need to think about, you know, what can I use that would be able to extend the grazing season? And um, potentially if I get in a situation where I don't have enough feed, because if we have a dry summer, it not only means not enough pasture, it also means that people in the area are not able to make as much hay. And so, you know, there's a hay shortage, and the price of hay goes up, and then we're stuck. So this, um, one of the other things I'm looking at this year, which I will, um, I'm planning on doing actually, is to grow some fodder um, so that I can have another source of good green winter feed and not be subject to, you know, the stresses of hay shortages and hay prices, that sort of thing. So I'm looking at all different alternatives there. 
And also um, the planning process helps me to determine um, where do I want to put the animals in the, the wintertime on the farm. Um, there are some areas of the farm that are, tend to be more wet. Others, like this particular paddock or this particular area, part of the farm, is very high and dry. There's very little mud, and so I can winter the cattle over there. I can feed them on the ground, um, and they do very well, and I leave them there until it's time to, for calving season, and I want them closer to home again. So it really allows me, again, to manage that complexity. Again, another... Um, Another way of creating resilience is really to think about how do you want to plan your finances. And I know that's not anything, well, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with grazing. It has a lot to do with grazing. But, you know, we cannot, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot determine what happens to us always. You know, we, things are going to happen. But, however, we can determine how we respond to that. And so by planning, being proactive in our planning, um, and responding very quickly when something does happen. In other words, um, if we are in a situation where we know we're not going to have enough feed, we plan as quickly as possible to decide, do I need to remove some of these animals now so I don't have to remove everybody when the day comes that we run out of feed. So um, just different, very briefly, um, holistic financial planning, again, does include an annual review, looking at what worked, what didn't. It's proactive planning. It's not just accounting. It's very proactive. You plan your income like many other um, types of, of financial planning, but in this case, you plan your profit. And planning profit is sometimes kind of a foreign concept to, to many people, but it involves determining what, what you estimate your income to be, how much profit do you actually want, and then what's left are the expenses. And then you have to be creative and figure out how am I going to limit my expenses. But it's just a different approach of looking at profit instead of just taking what's left over. And that means you need to prioritize expenses as well. It means monitoring. Um, monitoring your finances just like you would monitor your pastures or your rangeland. And then if things are going off track, you, you control, you get back on track. And when a crisis does occur, a big thing happens, sometimes you just need to go back and start all over and replan again. But it really is a great process and does help create resilience. Oops. Um, another, another way of creating resilience is um, we heard about diversifying the, the cover crops, d diversifying the plants. Um, we can also diversify our enterprises because if you've got all your eggs in one basket and you drop that basket, you know, you're done. So if you can have different enterprises that hopefully will provide other sources of income or maybe spread the sources or spread that income out over the year. And also value added, that was a huge thing for us as well. So these are just things that, you know, are, are things that you can do in the usual course of your business to help you get through the crisis when it does occur. And this is one of my ways of um, diversifying and creating resilience. Um, as of about three years ago, I got involved um, in Yak. And Yak, I found, I, I, I got them initially, just a, uh, three of them initially. Now I have about 30. But um, initially, because I love them, I just thought they were really fascinating animals. But I've also found that they eat very little. They are very easy on the land. Um, they can get through some tough weather conditions. Um, and um, they are a multi-purpose animal with fiber and meat and milk if you wanted to milk them, um, or if you wanted to ride them or pack them. I mean, there are lots of, of different options there. So that is one of my new little enterprises of diversity there are my yaks. Okay, so we all know we talk about uh, climate change and industry and burning of fossil fuels, of course, or you know, the huge thing that we see in the media all the time, but really agriculture has a lot to do with it as well. The tremendous amount of soil loss that we have from conventional cropping, um, you know, is pretty horrendous. I mean, take a, a drive to eastern Washington, you know, look in the wheat fields, although there have been tremendous improvements over the years, tremendous improvements, there's still, you know, there's still a lot of erosion going on, and we're, you know, we're eroding more soil than we're making food, which is unfortunate. So um, so what are some of the solutions that we can deal with climate change as producers? 
we can manage the triple bottom line more holistically, is take into account the environment, the finances, and the human aspect of it as well. So, and, and doing these things, diversifying um, can help us, and planning can help us create resilience. And to me, this is the, very dear to my heart, is using properly managed livestock, we can improve the land. I've seen it where I live, I've seen it all over the country, I have colleagues all over the world who are, are greatly improving the land, um, um, eliminating bare ground or nearly eliminating bare ground with the practices that they're using simply by using livestock in a different way. And of course, if we can keep the, the land covered, you know, we talked about if we can sequester carbon by um, having a lot of growing active plants and put that carbon back into the soil, um, that's, again, that's going to be a huge important thing that we can all do working together um, by the practices, our agricultural, agricultural practices. And of course, to sequester carbon, you know, it would be ideal to have a low-tech solution something low cost, something that might help farmers and ranchers become more sustainable, and also to feed, you know, the, that future population that we're, we're going to have. And so properly managed livestock, I believe, is something that is going to make a huge difference if we can work together. Um, another part of the solution is to create better policies, um, particularly when we're dealing with the land, dealing with management of land, dealing with the environment. Um, we need to create... A, um, policies that are more effective and address the root cause and not so much the symptoms. Most of the policies that we have in general, you know, whether it's environment, you know, land, business, oftentimes just deal with symptoms. So um, we need to take kind of a holistic approach to look at policies as well. Okay, um, and just to finish up, um, you know, sometimes it seems like it's a pretty overwhelming problem, pretty overwhelming situation. And how can you know, we make a difference? How can we change it? Um, when my children were young, I used to read a book to them called If Everybody Did. It was by Joanne Stover. And I loved the book. It was a very simple little picture book. And basically, she would ask the question, what would happen if everybody did you know, something? Whether it's like pick a bud or make a smudge or whatever. And my, the make the smudge was one of my favorite ones. Um, and this is what would happen if everybody did. You know, you just got this whole total black scene. So on the other hand, if we can all work together and we can change the way that we are doing our, our agricultural practices, our grazing practices, our, um, the way that we manage land, the way that we create policies and implement those policies, um, imagine what would happen if everybody did something, even a little bit of something. Um, we could be able to manage the lands in a better a much better way to, to sequester more carbon, to reduce climate change, to improve um, the health of the air and the water, bring back more salmon, live with, live with the um, nature instead of oftentimes fighting it or degrading it, and run happily in the fields. So that's pretty much it. Um, and I, I have, uh, my website is mathesonfarms.com. But the other thing that's very dear to my heart is I'm part of an organization, the Pacific Northwest Center for Holistic Management. And um, so we've got that website there too. But um, I, I can say that that has been the, the, the one big thing in my life and in my business that has allowed me to continue to stay on the farm and to be successful on the farm is changing the way that I make decisions and changing the, the practices on the farm. And that's it.